All right, we're ready to embark on chapter five. Quite a task it will be in our microbiology text, our Tortora textbook. Um, it's microbial metabolism. And there's a lot to it because microbes are very, very diverse in their metabolism. We're going to try to keep it under control and not get too deep in the weeds, but there is a, a lot of fundamental stuff we should know uh, basically about how um, various different types of microorganisms get their energy and get their carbon for building stuff and so forth, as you'll see. There's a little our, our chapter starting micrograph. Um, that if you don't brush your teeth enough or floss enough, plaque will build up on the surface of your teeth, and it's a biofilm of polysaccharides created by these bacteria that we see uh, lodged in there. And eventually bacteria that will colonize this biofilm will secrete some acid and uh, damage the enamel, the outer hard layer of your teeth, cause cavities. <clears throat> okay, our topic at hand, metabolism. What is metabolism? It's the sum of all chemical reactions in an organism or in a cell. We can break that down into two different groups or classes, reactions that break down stuff, making similar, simpler molecules from larger ones. That's catabolism. And we can have reactions that are building stuff, making larger, more complex molecules from smaller building blocks. That's called anabolism. You might have heard of the word anabolic. Uh, some people take anabolic steroids to help build muscle tissues. That's, that comes from that word anabolism, building, when cells build more complex molecules. So the general scheme of things <clears throat> is that nutrients are taken in by the cell and either created by the cell, but eventually we're going to use those nutrients. What do we use them for? We catabolize them, break them down into smaller, simpler molecules. Right here, the six carbon glucose being broken down to uh, CO2 and water. And in so doing, we're going to produce some energy. And we're going to use that energy to produce or capture it in the form of ATP. It's kind of the energy currency of cells. And then we're going to use that ATP to drive anabolic reactions. So anabolism down here at the bottom, this arrow pointing to the left, we're going to take building blocks, individual unit, chemical units of of biologically important macromolecules and assemble them together to build stuff. In this case, we're taking amino acids and polymerizing them or building them up together into proteins. So catabolism releases energy, which can then be used to drive anabolism. That's the general scheme of how things work in living cells. Um, it's not just amino acids to make proteins, but simple sugars will be used to build polysaccharides like the cell wall may be composed of chitin or um, cellulose. Polysaccharides might be storage in the cell like starch or glycogen. Fatty acids can be used to build um, either phospholipids or triglycerides, fat. Nucleotide bases can be used to produce nucleic acids, RNA and DNA. So some very familiar things. Catabolism, we're just going to get all the energy we need for all these building processes. That's what cells do all day is build stuff. The proteins are the structural and functional units. They're, they re, they represent almost all of the properties of a cell can be uh, boiled down to what proteins they're made of or that they have at their disposal. <clears throat> so... A metabolic pathway, so metabolism is a sum of chemical reactions. A metabolic pathway is a set of chemical reactions that are related in the sense of they're going to have one particular end goal. So a metabolic pathway might be designed to take an amino acid and make it into a particular protein, for example. Well, every step in the process of converting one thing into another in a cell um, is catalyzed or helped along made more efficient by enzymes, proteins that help chemical reactions take place. So every single one of the steps of chemical reactions that make up catabolism and anabolism, they're all catalyzed, made possible by enzymes. 
So enzymes are just proteins whose job it is to make these reactions feasible, make them go. <clears throat> the reason we need enzymes to do this is because a lot of the reactions that we're talking about require an input, an investment of energy to allow the molecules, the starting molecules, the reactants, to change in some way. We have to destabilize their electrons that they share in order to change the way they're shared or the way the molecules are arranged. And that takes some input of energy. And in many cases, it's much too much energy to ever really happen spontaneously at our body temperature, but an enzyme can lower that activation energy, lower the amount of energy that has to be put in to make the reaction proceed. <clears throat> so that's what we're really about. You have enzymes who are going to make it more likely for a reaction to take place, and therefore over time, more of the reactions take place, have a greater reaction rate more events are happening. So here's a little schematic diagram. You've probably seen something like this in the past. Here we have a simple reaction that's, that's represented by A, B, two um, atoms maybe connected together. And we're gonna have a catalyzed reaction and break them into two separate parts, A and B, two products. Um, in the absence of a catalyst, the energy required go from this middle line right here up to the top of this peak of the blue curve, that's how much energy, this blue line represents energy on the y-axis here, that's how much energy would have to be invested to get those things to break apart, destabilize their shared electrons and separate them from each other. Whereas if we have a catalyst present, an enzyme, only this smaller amount of energy is needed to get those things to break apart and so it's much more likely that that will occur, and enzymes can, in fact, catalyze things to such a degree that they recur, occur very efficiently. So that's that activation energy uh, that we need to be put in is much lower with enzymes present. <clears throat> enzymes are proteins, again, that catalyze these reactions. They grab a substrate by specifically binding to it and then making it uh, something happen to change it chemically. Um, sometimes there's a coenzyme involved, which is not a protein, it's another just component of the enzyme when it's in its active form. Um, so we'll have a couple of terminology. Here's a protein drawn in a cartoon form so you can see the kind of shapes that will accommodate certain things. In this case, it's inactive by itself. It's called an apoenzyme. The protein's there, it's all folded up correctly, but we need this coenzyme inserted into a specific position Excuse me, now we have the holoenzyme, the, the, the functional enzyme. All together, the, co the coenzyme plus the apoenzyme together makes an active enzyme. And now we can see it forms a binding site for this substrate, which will be able to pop down in there, and the enzyme will catalyze a chemical reaction. Without the coenzyme, the binding site doesn't exist for this particular substrate, and no reaction will take place at all. <clears throat> Some examples of coenzymes. Um, that we'll mention a lot in this chapter, NAD, NADP, and FAD. Those are all electron carriers. And when we catalyze, I'm sorry, a bunch of, of um, fuel molecules in order to get some energy out, break them down, we're going to release high-energy electrons, as you'll see, and we're going to capture them on these electron carriers. So these are coenzymes that allow chemical changes that involve releasing electrons at the same time without these coenzymes there, uh, the reactions can't take place. Uh, coenzyme A, as we'll see, is a, is a carrier for acetyl groups, two carbon um, chemicals that will be produced uh, from pyruvic acid. All those things will become apparent readily in, in the near future. <clears throat> so here's a little schematic diagram of an enzymatic reaction catalyzing this reaction. So here's our substrate. There's a specific binding site for this substrate, this enzyme, and the substrate can bind, nestle right in there. And now we have lowered the activation energy and you can see a split forming. This, this, and this enzyme can stabilize the two products in such a way that they can separate from each other and then they can be released. And now we have A plus B instead of AB, if you think back to our original example. Here's some classes of different types of enzymes. Uh, I guess these are more for familiarity than anything else, I think, probably. 
oxidoreductases are enzymes that catalyze oxidation reduction reactions, ones to which there's a transfer of electrons from one molecule to another. That's what those are about. Transferases, transferring a functional group from one molecule to another, such as an amine group. Amino transferases take an, a nitrogen off of one amino acid and swap it onto a different amino acid or what will become a different amino acid. Hydrolases break stuff down. They do hydrolysis. Hydrolysis is taking a water molecule and jamming it in where a bond was in, in a molecule and separating it into two separate parts by inserting that water in there. So hydrolases. Lyases, separating atoms apart without using the water in there. It's a different way of cutting molecules by enzymatic reaction. Isomerase just takes an organic compound and moves a carbon or a carbons from one place to another. So now it's technically a different compound. It has, can have quite different properties. So isomerase is just rearrange stuff. Ligases join together uh, two different molecules to form a larger one uh, using ATP, some energy to get that done. Kinases phosphorylate proteins. Um, proteins have side chains that oftentimes can accommodate a phosphate from ATP. We can break a phosphate off of that high energy adenosine triphosphate and fasten it onto a protein. And oftentimes that's how proteins and cells are controlled in terms of function. When you phosphorylate them, they become activated. When you dephosphorylate them, they're shut off. So kinases are just enzymes that uh, phosphorylate. There's another class of enzymes called phosphatases. Phosphatases remove those phosphates, dephosphorylate uh, molecules. Well, enzymes are proteins, and so they're subject to ideal conditions. There are certain conditions in which those enzymes produce the greatest rate of reaction with their substrates, and that's uh, controlled by temperature or affected by temperature. pH, how much substrate is present, and in, in the presence of any inhibitors that will block that enzyme from doing what it does. So again, enzymes are proteins, and proteins, <coughs> if you, excuse me, if you assemble a protein by, by stringing together a bunch of amino acids, it'll just naturally, or with some help of some chaperones, it'll fold up into a very precise shape. You can see all these little loop-de-loops. -loops. Those are called alpha helix. You can see these crisscrossing things. Those are called beta sheets. And those are very specific arrangements and folding of amino acids. And an enzyme will be like that. It has to fold up in a precise certain way to have its catabolic activity. Catalytic activity, I meant to say. Heavens. If you overheat or or lower the pH too much in the presence of this enzyme, it's going to unravel. It's going to unfold in some parts at least, and it's no longer going to be able to perform its function. It will no longer be able to catalyze reactions. That's called denaturation. A denatured protein can no longer do what it normally does. So that's why there's a sweet spot of temperature where if you raise the temperature, everything starts happening faster and faster and faster and faster. The enzyme's getting faster and more efficient, and then eventually it starts to unravel and things go bad. So increasing temperature increases reaction rates to a point, but if the enzyme starts to denature, it will no longer have any activity. So here's a, a graphical representation. Enzyme activity on the left, how many substrates per second are being converted into the products, and as we increase the temperature on the x-axis, look at what's happening. If, what's happening if you warm things up? Enzymatic reactions just take up, take place faster and faster and faster until you reach a sweet spot. Note that temperature, and then if you keep raising the temperature further, then the, and the, the protein unravels, it denatures, and we don't have any more activity at all. How interesting. The enzymes we're talking about, the enzymes and microbes for the most part, are optimal at 37 degrees Celsius. These are organisms uh, who's, who have come to um, live in our bodies as, as hosts, and they work best in our bodies at our body temperature. So at 37 degrees Celsius, we have some, some excellent um, efficiency of these enzymes doing their thing. And then, but if we heat them up too much, they can no longer work. <clears throat> Same thing with pH. What's the optimal pH for many enzymes? Um, and right around neutral pH, a little bit more acidic 
lot of microorganisms like things a little bit more acidic than neutral. Neutral, we would say, would be a pH 7. Our body pH is around 7.4 in our blood and our body fluids. Um, in this case, we see that these a lot of the enzymes that are exemplified here are have a little bit more of acidic pH optimum. But again, if you make the pH too acidic, you no more activity, denature that protein. If you make it too alkaline, no more activity. There's a sweet spot for every enzyme, a pH at which it is optimal in this rate of catalysis or reaction. <clears throat> How about the effect of substrate concentration? This is pretty interesting. If you increase this, if you have a, a handful of enzyme, enzyme molecules and you start adding slowly a little bit more and more substrate, at first you only have a few enzymes that have substrate bounce. You're, you're only producing a certain number of products per second. As you add more substrate, more and more of the enzymes are populated with substrate. We're producing more product faster. And so we see the rate of enzyme activity going up very quickly as we increase substrate concentration until at some point all the enzymes have substrate bound to them all the time. They release their product and immediately another substrate binds. And so there's no way to increase the enzyme rate anymore. That's called saturation. So at some substrate concentration, there's nothing advantageous about adding more substrate. There's a sweet spot in substrate concentration as well to get the most out of our enzymes and what they do. How about inhibitors? Sometimes inhibitors can block the activity of enzymes, and there's a couple of kind of inhibitors we're going to talk about. If we see, we see the, 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 the binding site for a substrate, or the so-called active site of an enzyme, um, if there's a, a chemical that shares some properties with the substrate itself, it may be able to bind in place of the substrate and block the substrate from binding. That's called a competitive inhibitor. So the more competitive inhibitor we add, the more it's going to start taking over more and more of these enzymes, and the less and less substrate can bind, and the, and the, and the enzymatic rate is going to go down. But if we start adding back more and more substrate, it's going to start displacing this inhibitor so that there's, the reaction rate starts to go back up. So these two things are competing with each other for access to the, to the active site of the enzyme. So a competitive inhibitor just gets in the way and outcompetes the substrate for binding. <clears throat> Here's an example. A certain type of antibiotic, the first antibiotic that was really um, effectively used in the marketplace, uh, sulfonilamide or sulfon sulfonamide or sulfa drugs, they worked as competitive inhibitors of this intermediate, this, this chemical that's needed for metabolism in the bacterial cells. So sulfa drugs would get in there into the active site. You can see how similar this aromatic ring and this amine group on here look. And so the, the sulfonilamide would get in there on the enzyme and prevent the enzyme from interacting with PABA and you wouldn't have any reactions. And so that's going to be an inhibitor of bacterial growth in that case. And so the, that was a way of blocking bacteria from growing in the body. <clears throat> Here's another kind of an inhibitor, a non-competitive inhibitor. Remember with a competitive inhibitor, if we raise up the substrate concentration high enough, it'll outcompete the competitive inhibitor and the reaction rate will start to rise back up again. With a, comp a non-competitive inhibitor, that won't happen because the non-competitive inhibitor binds to the enzyme elsewhere, not at the active site. But what it does is it changes the shape or conformation of the protein. So when it binds to the, to the, to the enzyme, the enzyme kind of twists, and now the active site is no more. It's no longer accessible to the substrate. It's just not there. And so it doesn't matter how much substrate concentration there is, there's no enzymatic activity. That's a non-competitive inhibitor. Another name for that process is called allosterism. An allosteric effect is one in which this chemical binds to the protein at a site other than the, than the active site or the substrate binding site, 
but it affects the substrate binding site nevertheless. Here's where the, where the inhibitor is binding. Here's where it has its effect somewhere else in the protein because the protein changes shape. It's called an allosteric effect or allosterism. <clears throat> so when would we see this in real life maybe? Well, here's an example of a metabolic pathway in which we start out with a particular substrate and a series of chemical reactions take pla takes place of, of each catalyzed by a different enzyme. And finally, we form an end product. That was the goal all along. We can't do it in one step. We need to use multiple enzymes to get it done. And here's our product. But in order to make a cell efficient, once there's a, there's a, a, a sufficient amount of this product produced, we don't want to just keep on using cellular resources to make more of it. It feeds back and it has an allosteric effect on this enzyme 1 and blocks it. Non-competitive inhibitor of enzyme 1 so that the more of this product that builds up, the more it inhibits the pathway that produced it. That way, the level of that product stays constant in the cell all the time. If it starts to disappear, if we start utilizing it for something and it starts to go down, we're going to disinhibit this enzyme, enzyme 1, and the pathway will be really turned on. So it's usually the first enzyme in a process that's controlled by the product to be efficient. We don't want to make a whole bunch of intermediate products and just block things here at the last step. We have all these intermediates floating around in the cell and we're wasting energy making them. So the, the, the um, so-called uh, regulated step um, or rate limiting step oftentimes it's called of a pathway is that first enzyme in the pathway will be inhibited by, its, by the final product. Pretty cool stuff. Efficiency in cellular metabolism. Real briefly, um, for a long time, all enzymes that were known were proteins, chains of amino acids. More recently, it's been discovered that some RNA molecules, ribonucleic acid molecules, have M enzymatic activity, amazingly. They can actually cut and assemble pieces of RNA. And I don't know if you remember from general biology, if you took that, or high school biology, um, when RNAs are often produced in order to synthesize some proteins, first they're transcribed from a gene, then they have to be modified in some way. We have to cut out some pieces of the eukaryote and splice together the ends, and, uh, and sometimes ribozymes are involved in that process to get that RNA into its final form that can be used to translate a protein. All right, then. <clears throat> We're going to move on to another topic. redox reactions very prevalent in cellular metabolism more formally redox reactions are oxidation reduction reactions and that simply means reactions that involve transferring electrons or pairs of electrons between molecules oftentimes along with hydrogen atoms so reduction means gaining electrons oxidation means giving up electrons and they happen in pairs. One molecule will give up electrons to the other. It becomes oxidized, and the second one becomes reduced at the same time. Redox reactions catalyzed by an enzyme. <clears throat> so oftentimes, during catabolism, let's say we're oxidizing a glucose molecule. Oh, there I go again. I don't know where I went. Huh. I haven't figured out that mystery yet. That's all right. Um, <clears throat> during a lot of, of energy producing reactions, catabolism, um, in order to break down two molecules, an enzyme will require a cofactor. We've got to release some electrons and they'll be captured by the cofactor. Now we have a held on to them, we can have them at our disposal to use uh, in the future for some other processes. So during We'll, we'll, we'll wait. I'm tempted to run ahead of myself. So NAD, if you remember, was an electron carrier. It's a cofactor for an enzyme that will break down glucose molecules into two, capture some electrons, and now we have NADH. So here's a little redox reaction cartoon happening. <clears throat> We're going to transfer electron over from this orange ball over to NAD as the cofactor. So now this orange molecule has been oxidized and NAD, NAD has been reduced, excuse me. 
Now it's in the form of NADH. Now it's got this electron, which is great. The electron can be very useful to us, but it's now on there, and we have to, in order to be able to do this reaction again, we're going to have to get this NADH back in the form of NAD to accommodate another uh, product or reactant A to be able to do this redox reaction. So as glucose molecules are coming through, we have to find somewhere to get rid of those electrons that are now on the NADH and the, and the protons. Here's a more real-life schematic diagram of an <clears throat> organic molecule giving up a pair of electrons to NAD during an oxidation reaction, which it becomes oxidized and NAD becomes reduced. So now we have NADH plus an extra hydrogen ion that's floating around. You see the two electrons right here. Now they're held onto by this carrier, this coenzyme, and we'll be able to use those to our benefit later on. Meanwhile, this this potato molecule, it looks like, has been oxidized, and it doesn't show it, but if during this process it would have been changed chemically also, because the whole point is we're trying to do this oxidation step. We're trying to break down the glucose into some other products. So they didn't really show that happening, but just showing you a redox reaction taking place. It doesn't always involve chemically changing this molecule that much. All right. <clears throat> How about... ATP. Where do we get ATP from? That's the energy currency of the cell. It's how we store uh, energy for chemical reactions later on. We oxidize a bunch of fuel molecules, catch the, the energy in the form of ATP, and we can store it for however long, and we can use the ATP to give the energy back and drive some cellular processes. So we start out with an ADP, adenosine diphosphate, two phosphates here on the adenosine, and then we're going to take some energy from some reactions and some oxidation reactions, presumably some catabolism. We're going to take a high, take an inorganic phosphate and attach it on in such a way there's a large amount of energy stored in that bond. It takes a lot of energy to form an ATP from an ADP, and now that energy is stored in there like having a, a brand new glow stick that's never been uh, lit up. That's the ATP is kind of like we have all that potential energy right in that that last that third phosphate phosphate bond pretty cool <clears throat> there's a couple of ways of doing that sometimes you can take a phosphate that's already on a mo an organic molecule and transfer it onto adp and get an atp out of it that's called substrate level phosphorylation we had an organic molecule of some kind, some carbon and oxygen and hydrogens and so forth, and we transfer a phosphate over onto ADP to get ATP under the right conditions. Oxidative phosphorylation is what happens in <clears throat> either bacteria or mitochondria when we produce a hydrogen ion gradient through the electron transport chain to drive the production of a large amount of ATP it's not a, as much of a direct thing as that's happening as we'll see later. Oxidative phosphorylation is how we make a large amount of ATP uh, um, from our from our um, catabolism reactions. <clears throat> so we'll talk a lot, a lot about that. Photophosphorylation may be somewhat new, maybe not. It's the idea that we can use energy, or some organisms can use energy from light photons to drive phosphorylation adding the phosphate this is what phosphorylation is adding that third phosphate to adp to produce atp so for example in a chloroplast this is an organelle that will allow the production of adp atp from adp using light energy well, that's pretty cool stuff so here's an example of a cartoon of phosphate or um, substrate level phosphorylation we have a phosphate attached on an organic compound. It just shows the carbons. There would actually be some hydrogen sticking onto these carbons. We're going to transfer that phosphate onto ADP to form ATP by a specialized enzyme that can do that thing. And uh, there's some energy. There's energy release when we bust this phosphate off of this organic compound. We use that energy to clamp that phosphate onto the ADP to form ATP. How about oxidative phosphorylation? Let's get a little bit of a better feel for what's going on with that. <clears throat> it's going to involve the electron transport chain. So we saw that we may we have an, a coenzyme, NAD, that can capture high-energy electrons and hydrogens during oxidation 
of say a glucose molecule. Now we've got these high energy electrons. We can hand them off. This is a whole series of proteins in the membrane of a bacterium or in the inner membrane of a, of a mitochondrion. Hand off those electrons. They're super energetic. And as we hand them off, they give up a little energy and they get handed off to another protein and give up a little energy each time. That's why it's drawn like kind of a downhill thing. As we're just going to, it's a chain. We're just going to pass those electrons, redox reactions happening one after the other uh, down this chain. And each time energy is given up, we're going to be able to utilize that energy for making uh, ATP out of it, as we'll see in a bit. So that's the electron transport chain, passing the electrons along. At the end, there has to be somewhere to get rid of them. Otherwise, they would just clog up this last cytochrome and, and the whole thing would stop. So at the end, they got to get kicked out. Um, one way that can be done is to combine the electrons plus oxygen atoms, uh, oxygen molecules, I should say, and hydrogens and form water molecules. And now we've taken away the electrons and that cytochrome is now, cytochrome A3 is now free again. We can pass another pair of electrons down. But there's microorganisms that use of different compounds or chemicals other than oxygen to capture those electrons. So whereas probably most of your life you've learned about aerobic respiration, where you need oxygen to catch those electrons at the end of the electron transport chain, there's microorganisms that can do it uh, anaerobically. They can do respiration, get a lot of ATPs out of the deal, but they don't need oxygen to catch those electrons in the end. So bacteria, microorganisms are very versatile metabolically. We'll come back to this in a little more detail later. We've got to see what is all the energy being used for as those electrons travel down this electron transport chain. Where's the ATP part? We haven't said a word about that yet, so that's coming up. First, let's take a look at photophosphorylation just briefly to introduce that idea. So what's going on there? Well, there's two different photosystems that may exist um, in, a, in an organism that allow a couple of different things to happen, and we'll look more closely at these so we don't need to spend a ton of time right now, but here's, here's some light photons coming in, and chlorophyll is a pigment that's designed to be able to capture the energy from certain wavelengths of light, and then use that to excite some electrons, which can be given up then and transferred, a redox reaction, to some proteins in an electron transport chain, and then eventually those electrons come right back to the chlorophyll. But the energy that's, that's liberated as those electrons go from, from protein to protein to protein to protein can be used to make ATP. So that's called photophosphorylation. We're phosphorylating ADP to make ATP. Where are we getting the energy from? From light. So photophosphorylation. There's another thing happening down below in which we're going to do a similar thing. We're going to use the energy uh, from light coming into chlorophyll to produce some ATPs, but there's going to be some other uh, benefits in this particular system. We'll save this discussion of photosystem 2, so-called non-cyclic photophosphorylation, uh, in, to a little bit later slide. Right, cyclic, you can see the electrons coming from the chlorophyll that were excited, going down through a series of electron transport proteins and right back to the chlorophyll. Here, that's not happening. We're supplying the electrons from somewhere else to the chlorophyll, exciting them and letting them off somewhere else uh, to use for something else uh, later on. So anyway, we'll come back to that. Carbohydrate catabolism. <clears throat> so what's going on with that? The first series of reactions in carbohydrate catabolism is called glycolysis. It's a series of 10 chemical reactions, and there's particular inputs and products that I want you to know, but what I do want to tell you is this is a kind of a complex chapter already in our book. You do not need to know the individual steps of glycolysis. In your book, it'll show you a diagram of every single chemical in those, in those 10 steps of glycolysis and the enzymes that, that catabolize the, or catalyze the, the reactions. Don't worry about it. I just want you to know what is produced by glycolysis. It's glucose molecules are going to get oxidized through a series of 10 chemical reactions and produce some specific products. Those products are going to enter into another set of reactions called the Krebs cycle. And finally, uh, electrons that have been garnered from 
glycolysis and Krebs cycle are going to pa be passed down that electron transport chain to make ATP. So let's start with glycolysis. We're going to oxidize glucose molecules and we're going to produce pyruvic acid. Glucose is a six carbon sugar. We're just going to basically bust it in half and produce two, three carbon pyruvic acids. That's what it happens. It takes 10 chemical reactions to make that happen. We can finally bust the thing in half and wind up with two pyruvic acids and two net ATPs and two NADHs. Remember, these are the coenzymes that now have high energy electrons attached to them. Those are useful. Those are energetic substances that we can use for something. All right, so here down here is what, what, chemists, what makes chemists happy, a balanced equation. A glucose molecule <clears throat> plus two ATPs. What? Why is ATP on the left side? We have to invest two ATPs to make some of the reactions happen of those 10 reactions. So glucose plus two ATP plus two additional ADPs plus two inorganic organic phosphates and two coenzymes, two NADs. 10 chemical reactions, what do we get? Two pyruvic acids, four ATPs come out, two NADHs with those high energy electrons plus the hydrogens. So you see we had to invest two ATPs, we got four out, if we subtract, here's how many we put in. That's usually when we talk about glycolysis, we just talk about a net production of two ATPs. Just so you know, we're actually producing four, but we had to put two in, in the early stages and so the outcome is the net outcome is two brand new ATPs and two NADHs. So that's glycolysis. You should know those what's going in and what's coming out. You don't have to balance this whole equation. You can ignore those ATPs going in because we're just going to get two out. So it's a lot of times people just when they write this reaction they just leave out those go glucose plus two ADP Plus, I don't even put the phosphates in there. We just assume there's a lot of phosphate in the cell. So you might just write glucose plus two ADP plus two NADs produces two pyruvic acids plus two ATPs plus two NADHs. Typically how it's written. All right. <clears throat> wow, here's a fancy looking affair. This is just trying to combine those three things we looked at in carbohydrate catabolism into one diagram. You have glucose, right? This is 10 chemical reactions here happening right here. Glucose is oxidized to produce pyruvic acids. The pyruvic acids can then enter into Krebs cycle, a cyclic series of chemical reactions. Uh, first, we have to convert it to acetyl-CoA. We saw that coenzyme A before. Well, pyruvic acid is going to get converted to acetyl-CoA. That's what enters into Krebs cycle and run it through there. And in the end, the carbons from the acetyl group, those two carbons are going to be low given off as CO2, we're going to get ATP out of the deal, but we're going to get a bunch of electrons that we can, again, use later. Here's the electrons that came from glycolysis. Here's some more that come from Krebs cycle. We're going to use those, transfer those right to uh, the electron transport chain, as we saw, excuse me, and make ATPs. We still got to go back and talk about how we're going to actually make those ATPs, but we will. Excuse me. Alternatively, the pyruvic acids can be converted to what's called a fermentation product. Sometimes we don't convert the pyruvic acid into acetyl-CoA and run it through the Krebs cycle. Instead, we get those electrons off of the NADH back right back onto the pyruvates and turn it into something else. Turn it into lactic acid, for example. Those are called fermentation products. This reaction is fermentation reactions. Why are we doing this? We're not going to be doing Krebs cycle on this occasion. And we have to get the NADs back into the form of NA, NADHs, back in the form of NADs, so they can go back and, and undergo glycolysis. We've got to have NAD to do glycolysis, and it produces NADH. If we're not going to use the NADH for, for Krebs cycle, we've got to get it back in the form of NAD somehow. How do we do that? fermentation. That's the sole purpose for doing that. A lot of microorganisms uh, do do that process to get rid of the electrons to do more glycolysis, break down more glucoses. We still get some ATPs out. Look, there they are. So it's still beneficial. I'm going to form some fermentation products. <clears throat>
<clears throat> a couple of little aside things. There's another series of chemical reactions that are commonly present in cells, the pentose phosphate pathway. And the pentose phosphate pathway is involved in making and utilizing pentoses. Glucose, galactose, and fructose, those are hexoses. Six carbon sugars. We're very familiar with those uh, in various contexts. Pentoses are five carbon sugars, and they're the ones that are used for making the nucleotide bases that are the building blocks of DNA and RNA. So these are just some side reactions that allow us to make the pentoses and then the bases that are needed for, for nucleic acid synthesis. And NADPH, it just so happens, is the electron carrier in these sets of reactions. Instead of NADH, it's NADPH. <clears throat> Entner Deuteroff pathway is a different series of chemical reactions, sort of runs parallel or for, uh, has a similar function as glycolysis, just a different set of chemical reactions, a different set of enzymes. So it gives some versatility. It allows cells to have some different products that are produced along the way during oxidation of glucose. And they produce, it produces different building blocks for making anabolism, for making other stuff later on. So it just creates some versatility metabolically for the cells. All right. <clears throat> Let's go to the Krebs cycle. So now we know that glycolysis or entner deuteroff pathway produce some pyruvic acids. Now we're going to enter those into the Krebs cycle. First, we're going to decarboxylate these, break off a CO2. One of the carbons has got to go. Pyruvate is a three-carbon sugar or a three-carbon organic molecule. We're going to break off one carbon in the form of CO2 and be left with an acetyl group two carbon. But again, don't worry about that so much. Just so you know, we take the pyruvates, we convert it to acetyl-CoA. That's what enters into it. We stick the the acetyl group into the Krebs cycle and it runs through in a cycle, in a circle essentially, and gives off some electrons. So again, just going back to our diagram, now we're looking down here. We have acetyl CoA coming for the pyruvates. <clears throat> we run it through there, and the last two carbons are given off as sewage CO2. We do get some ATP out of the deal at substrate level phosphorylation, but the greatest benefit is producing more high energy electrons or catching or high energy electrons on these coenzymes, these, these carriers, which along with the uh, electrons from glycolysis are gonna be shuttled down and, and transferred to the electron transport chain. <clears throat> so the electron transport chain, what, now we're gonna talk about how we actually get the ATP out of the deal, finally. Um, chemiosmosis is one thing it's, it's called, um, Oxidative phosphorylation is another uh, way it's described, another terminology, but chemiosmosis is fine. Um, let's take a look at what's happening there. When we transfer those electrons into um, the electron transport chain, I apologize, I should have deleted this. This is an animation that no longer will play in the current status of our, uh, our uh, Microsoft Office products. So uh, I'll try to eventually make some, start making some, some cool um, videos available to you. They're just kind of large and so I can't post them on the Moodle page. They won't let me post anything larger than the Moodle page, which is uh, it's regrettable. Anyway, so now we're down here the electron transport chain. So let's look down here and see what's going on with that. How does that actually work? Here's the picture we saw before. All the NADHs, and FADHs, the carriers of high energy electrons are going to deliver those electrons through redox reactions to the electron transport chain and we just redox, redox, redox all the way down through to the very end, giving up energy at each step of the way. And at the end, we got to have somewhere to get rid of those electrons. As we said, one of the familiar ways is to pass it on to an oxygen molecule or an oxygen atom. We're going to use one oxygen plus electrons plus a hydrogen to produce, or two hydrogens to produce water. Okay, now finally getting down to brass tacks. What is happening with the with chemiosmosis? And look at all the arrows now. Don't be put off by all the arrows. All they're showing you is two things happening. Electrons being handed down this electron transport chain, giving up energy, and hydrogen ions being pumped from inside here below across this membrane where the electron transport chain is situated. 
up above here. In a mitochondrion, this would be the space between the membranes, the two inner and outer membranes of a mitochondrion. Here you can see a mitochondrion has two membranes. And so in that space in between, we're pumping the hydrogen ions. They're accumulating and they're forming a great big gradient. As they accumulate in there, we have a high concentration of hydrogen ions. They're going to push their way back down through. And the only pathway they have to go back down through is this very fancy um, protein complex called ATPase. It's an enzyme that makes ATP. As hydrogen ions push their way down through, it's actually like a little machine. It has an actual rotor that turns. And as it turns around, using the energy from the hydrogen ions pushing through there, it will generate ATPs. Now that is cool and magical stuff. ADP plus inorganic phosphate that's floating around in this fluid in here is going to be used to make ATPs. So you can see how kind of a little bit more indirect it is because we're really just creating a large gradient which can power this machine. And it's all coming from electrons being handed off that came from Krebs cycle, which takes place down here in the inner, uh, in the in, inner part of the mitochondria or in a bacterial cytoplasm. I didn't get around to mentioning because I got all excited about this. Um, this electron transport chain can exist in the membrane, the phospholipid membrane of a bacterium. Hence the theory that as the bacterium like this entered into a cell by being wrapped up in its, its cell membrane, you wound up with a mitochondria that has an outer membrane and an inner membrane. The inner membrane might represent what used to be the bacterial membrane, and it has the electron transport system in there just like it does in the bacterial membrane. So, all right, that's the idea. We're either going to pump the hydrogen ions out of the bacterium into the space, paraplasmic space is called, meaning around the, the cytoplasm of the bacteria, or into this uh, space in between the membranes of the mitochondrion, and, uh, and do this chemiosmosis. Now you know where the energy is coming, where the, the ATP is coming from. So you see the electrons being handed off into this first uh, part of the electron transport chain, and then handed off to this cytochrome, and then handed off to this cytochrome, and so forth, all the way down the line, until finally you got to get rid of the electrons. It could be an oxygen, it could be a nitrate, different things, uh, different uh, chemicals can serve as an electron acceptor. Uh, in different microorganisms. All right. <clears throat> or you could have NADH or electrons from NADH or chlorophyll. And we talked about um, this same kind of process happening using photons of light, photophosphorylation. Well, here we have those kinds of electrons coming up into the electron transport chain. Here they just drew it as one blob to simplify. Same thing, pumping hydrogen ions across the membrane into this space. They're accumulating and they push their way down through, right? There's a concentration gradient. High concentration here, low concentration here. They're pushing their way down through, increasing ATP. So there you have it. Oxidation of carbohydrates through three steps, three processes to produce a large number of ATPs. So, <clears throat> as I said, if this takes place using oxygen as the final acceptor of electrons down here, right here's the oxygen, that's called aerobic respiration, but it could be called anaerobic respiration, still using these the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, but a, a, a chemical other than oxygen uh, being used to capture those electrons. So very versatile are these microorganisms. Let's take a quick break. And um, we'll wrap up this, this part of Chapter 5, and then we'll go on to Part 2 of Chapter 5 and talk about a few other topics in microbial metabolism.